Um, we want to thank the McCain Institute, uh, the Enchantment Resort for this incredible event. This is uh, the first time that I have been back in, in uh, Arizona since uh, 2018 for the Senator McCain Memorial Service that was held here. Um, I'm, if you can't see these socks, these are taco socks. And um, I have uh, been in the middle of a vacation and we've got the news and I got sent here on the fly and I packed every single thing for that trip but socks. <laughs> so I woke up the morning of the memorial service at the Biltmore and walked into the gift shop of the, uh, of the Biltmore and the only pair of socks they had were these taco socks. And so I figured, well, they're still here. This is, this is a nice memory. <laughs> um, all right, well, listen, uh, we are here to talk about the law of the sea of China. It's, uh, it's gonna have some echoes from the morning uh, the, the morning bit on deterrence of uh, China that Senator Kelly, Congressman Boyle, John Finer were here for. We've got two great people here to talk. Uh, Admiral Linda Fagan, the 27th Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, she is the first female military service chief of any of the uh, military mm -hmm. units. Thank you. Um, uh, most specifically for what our topic is, at one point she ran the Pacific Area for the Coast Guard. She has received the Coast Guard Distinguished Service Medal, graduated from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy in 1985. Uh, to her left, Senator Todd Young. He was elected to the U.S. Senate in 2016. Um, incidentally, I met him uh, for really the first time on that campaign, and the first event stop was at a Boston Scientific medical device manufacturer outside Bloomington, Indiana, and it was all about chips and manufacturing, and uh, I should have known where his career was gonna go. We'll get to, we'll get to some of that. He is the co-author uh, co of the CHIPS Act. Um, he was elected in that year in 2016. He was elected to the U.S. House in 2010. Uh, he grew up in Indiana. After graduating, high school in 1990, he enlisted in the Navy first. And it was only a year later that he got his appointment to the Naval Academy. And uh, upon graduating there, he was commissioned in the Marine Corps, did intel service, was uh, honorably discharged in 2000. I got all that right, right? You did. All yeah, right, thanks. Yeah, when it comes job. to the military and these titles, these are very important. Now, the details. taco socks haven't slowed you down. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Admiral Fagan. Yep. A lot of us, sort of, like the Coast Guard for a lot of us is this thing that we don't necessarily know what they do and, yeah. you know, they're rescuing people from their own stupidity out in the oceans <laughs> yes, or something. Yes, we do do that, yep. But this is a military service that is deeply engaged in the Pacific theater and in all around the world. So take us off and, you know, right. give your introduction and tell us about Okay. what you all do. All right, thank you. And I'd like to start by thanking the McCain Institute, but more specifically the McCain family uh, for their, uh, their service and commitment to the nation. And I know that Jimmy McCain is deployed uh, today uh, supporting and ensuring our, our national security. So thank you, and it is really a privilege to be here. This is my... <laughs> my, my first time to Sedona, and um, my family was like, there's not much water in Sedona, Arizona, so why are you going as the head of the <laughs> Coast Guard? And so last night at dinner, it became apparent as I, I was speaking with a couple, couple of folks at the table that it probably is important to start with just what is this thing that we call the United States Coast Guard? We are one of the six branches of the US military at all times. At all times, we're a military service, a law enforcement agency, a regulatory agency, a maritime first response agency. And so that does include search and rescue. So should you find yourself in trouble at sea, we will be there to help you from your predicament. We're some of the world's, uh, world's best. But as a military agency, a law enforcement agency, and a regulatory agency, it brings a unique set of authorities that create an incredibly nimble and flexible organization that allows us 
to exercise that authority in a way that is particularly conducive to our national security. I should highlight as well that we are not one of the armed services in the Department of Defense. I, my, my boss is the, the Secretary of Homeland Security, and so we work in the Department of Homeland uh, Security. And, and that is exactly the right department where the Coast Guard belongs. It's well suited for the types of work that we do, both in the, in the homeland and abroad. I'd note that uh, we, are, we are globally deployed, nationally based. The US Coast Guard deployed globally for World War II, and in many regards, we never fully came home. We have conducted worldwide operations as a U US Coast Guard for many, many years. And so as we talk more specifically at, about our work in the Pacific, that is not new work. We are a Pacific nation. We've been in the Pacific as a nation, and the US Coast Guard has been, been in the Pacific doing that work. Uh, we are about 55,000 strong active duty and reservists. I've got an all-volunteer uh, arm that's about 20,000, 12-plus billion dollar a year uh, organization. And an interesting uh, fact that may stick with you, of the NATO navies, I'm the third largest. The US Navy being first, uh, Turkey being second, they've got more people, and the US Coast Guard would come in as the third largest navy in NATO. So at least you think we're small and uh, you know, sort of focused on the coast. We do do that work. We do critical work uh, in the homeland around securing our economic prosperity as it pertains to the marine transportation system. But let me stop there, and I look forward to, uh, to seeing where the conversation goes. OK, Senator, some opening statements and sort of thoughts in broad, uh, broad strokes about China and, and sort of our role there in the Pacific. Um, thank you so much, Paul, and, and uh, so great to be with the Admiral, uh, who is doing an exceptional job and, and leading our fine Coast Guard. I want to thank the McCain Institute. Uh, this is my first time ever at this forum, and uh, in addition to the natural beauty of this, uh, this place, um, I'm just really encouraged by the thoughtful conversation at a time when there's not enough thoughtful conversation occurring in our country. Um, I'm grateful to the McCain family for continuing uh, to uh, carry the, the late Senator McCain's uh, uh, legacy forward in, in this uh, incredibly meaningful way. Um, John McCain came to visit me in 2016 when I was uh, running for the Senate. Uh, it was late in that election cycle. It was unclear whether we were going to win, but I was a Naval Academy graduate, and that's important to him. And uh, despite the fact that his own reelection was still not a certainty. He took time away from his own election to support me, bring some visibility to the campaign, say nice words, help us raise some resources. Um, that's, that's the sort of guy he, he was. And, and so that gesture uh, meant so much to me. Serving with uh, the late senator is, is something I'll always be proud of. But when I think of John McCain, I want to share this for those who were close with Senator McCain, members of his family. Um, I think of, as I was, I was heading towards that re-election, he'd come and appeared, I guess I passed the test because um, I started to get phone calls from people I didn't know, whose names I didn't know, encouraging me to think about joining the Armed Services Committee uh, so that I could be on Senator McCain's committee, right? Um, I got one call and I was polite and took it and then I got another call and I probably had two dozen calls uh, before the election, to uh, encourage me to think uh, about this and commit to uh, trying to be on the Armed Services Committee. Um, he was such a determined man. Uh, this lobbying campaign is ultimately something I, I, I told him. I had uh, a positive experience generally in the military. I was very proud of my military service. But I had some other interests, and it plays right into where we're headed with this conversation. Um, I had some private sector experience, trained in economics after I let, left the Naval Academy, after I left the Marine Corps, uh, in which I had some collaboration with the Coast Guard and, and various operational capacities. But um, So I, I was interested in economics. I was interested in uh, the diplomatic enterprise, having worked for uh, my own home state senator, Dick Luger, who chaired the Foreign Relations Committee years ago. And I, I've tried to identify committees that I feel like are being underutilized uh, as we, we had new competitors coming uh, into the fore. 
I think the Commerce Committee, which is where we oversee uh, the United States Coast Guard, uh, is one of those committees. Others that I sit on the Finance Committee with our tax code, with our trade prerogatives, uh, I think are underutilized in responding to the threat of the Chinese Communist Party. And uh, ever since I got into the Senate, I've, I've tried to focus on some of these issues. In short, we'll be talking today about uh, the, the law of the sea. China is seeking, not just as it relates to sea power, but in other domains as well, they are seeking to undermine the rules-based order that has benefited uh, the United States of America and humanity for generations. They do it every day. And as it relates to the sea, that, that generally means uh, constraining freedom of navigation. Uh, it, it means harassing uh, vessels, uh, whether they're American or, or in particular other countries, Philippines, uh, has been in the news over the last week, and you heard about that earlier on, on, on Senator Kelly's panel. Um, but harassing vessels that are, are trying to utilize their patches of the sea uh, to extract natural resources, whether they're fish or mineral or, or, or what have you. And so, I mean, this is an area that I don't think a whole lot of uh, Americans have a great appreciation of, but it's really important, consistent with our grand strategy as a country that we balance China in the Pacific and that we continue to enable ourselves and others to trade and to prevent our largest economy competitor and adversary, China, from weaponizing our mutual dependency on markets and preying on us and other nations. That is what this conversation, in short, is all about when we start sure. talking about why law of the sea is important and in what context should we be considering? Um, Admiral Fagan, can you describe some of these events? The, the, the earlier panel was talking in sort of generics about essentially firing on Philippine, yeah. Filipino ships. Like, yes. What are some of the specifics that we are seeing here, yeah. and what role has the Coast Guard been able to play in this region, in this theater, um, to try, is it to deter, protect? What are some of the Yeah, the and real so the earlier conversations was specifically around Chinese Coast Guard, uh, you know, trying to prevent Philippine Coast Guard from resupplying at the, the second Thomas Shoals. It's been, you know, it's, it's harassing, it's pulling. At the end of the day, it is an attempt to prevent a nation from ensuring their own sovereignty. And there are some competing uh, claims around sovereignty with that particular uh, shoal. The Coast Guard's value proposition in this space, and we talk a lot as a nation about you know, the competitive space, gray zone uh, conflict, short, short of major conflict. It is exactly suited and situated for the US Coast Guard and the type of work that we do in the region. We are very good at meeting a nation, pick a small island nation in the Pacific. We meet them where they are with what they may need. We come, we offer uh, a means to enforce their own sovereignty, create capability and capacity uh, in their exclusive economic zones. So for example, the Coast Guard cutter Harriet Lane, it's a 270 foot cutter that had previously been home ported on the east coast of the United States. In December, that home port was changed to Honolulu, and she's just returned from a 90-plus day patrol in the South Pacific, Fiji, Vanuatu, Samoa, American Samoa, where we uh, exercised one, several of our 12 bilateral shipwriter agreements with nations in the area. And so the ship arrives, the US Coast Guard ship, and we bring sh ship riders, people from that nation, who have the authority to enforce that nation's fisheries laws and regulation. We take them out into their exclusive economic zones, they extend 200 miles offshore, and allow them to enforce their own fishing rights, their own sovereignty, boarding fi Chinese fishing vessels in their EEZs. And in the case of Vanuatu, it had been nearly five years since they'd been able to do that type of enforcement in their own sovereign uh, waters. And so, whether it's a bilateral, a minilateral, or a multilateral approach to help a nation create their own capacity to enforce their own sovereignty is really uh, some of the value proposition that the United States Coast Guard brings in, into the mission space. And in a way that isn't uh, pejorative, it doesn't, it's like, 
Do you need help learning to, can we help you repair your small boat engines? Can we help you learn how to do those law enforcement boardings better? What is it that you need, and whether it's a ship or a bilateral agreement or training teams, we, we offer that without, without any, uh, you know, just basically the best of what it means to be a democracy, uh, demonstrating the rule of law, and what it means to preserve a free and open uh, Pacific, and frankly, free and open maritime lanes, lanes of and communication. And are you seeing real hard success stories in terms of, you know, protecting their, their fishing yeah. industries and... So there, we are absolutely seeing results. The challenge, and if any of you have spent time in the Pacific, and many of us have, there is a lot of water out there. <laughs> and uh, there's just not, you know, creating capacity. There's, there's more demand for the U.S. Coast Guard, more demand for ally and partner access than any of the allies and partners or the U.S. Coast Guard can create uh, capacity for. And so uh, creating space, too, for a broad, as I said, multilateral, minilateral conversation so that we all, as allies and partners with, with focus and shared interests, can, can create that, that opportunity. And we do, we do see results. Uh, I know we're talking about the Pacific, but I will uh, talk specifically about countering the Chinese squid fleet uh, off of the Galapagos. So this was a couple years ago. Uh, the uh, Ecuadorians asked for assistance to counter the squid fleet. U.S. Coast Guard ship was redirected, uh, sailed in the direction of the Chinese squid fleet, and they, and they moved up out of uh, the exclusive economic zone of Ecuador. So presence and partnership absolutely creates impact and capacity. Wow, Ecuador. Uh, Senator, when you are traveling uh, in, to, in this region or meeting uh, foreign delegations coming yeah. to Washington, you know, what are they telling you about these issues and what are, you know, what, what are the steps that you, they want from Washington, from Congress? Uh, I'm hearing a lot about these issues and over the last year or so I've, I've sort of dedicated myself uh, to traveling regionally across the Indo-Pacific and, and uh, everywhere I head uh, there's an emphasis from our uh, counterparties on the need to heighten and uh, maintain uh, at, at, at uh, the most basic level our collaboration uh, militarily but also as it relates to uh, our Coast Guard and the maritime enforcement mission and building partner capacity, something the Coast Guard uh, does very well because there is uh, a lot of water. Uh, there's, there's a very big ocean across the uh, Indo-Pacific. We don't have enough vessels, the United States of America working with our, our closest allies, uh, to cover all of that ocean. We are behind. Just look at the Navy numbers, uh, the most recent FY24 budget. They're projecting that by 2030, uh, we are going to see 290 vessels uh, battle-ready United States, and uh, you know the Chinese are projected to have 435. So uh, we we are behind. It takes a long time to build these vessels. It takes a lot of money and some political capital, and and so I'm hearing that, but I'm also hearing things that are cert frankly uh, a little more in in, in my jurisdiction, which uh, pertain to. Uh, the, the norms, the rules, uh, and in particular, I'll dive into the UN Convention on right. on, on class. Yeah. right? On Our class. first reference on the law <laughs> on the law of the sea. I thought we'd get there. We're about halfway through, so I, um, I was yeah. teeing you up. Yeah. I was going. No, it was that, was my, that was my <laughs> follow-up. So you're you're ahead. Explain so it. I mean, yeah. this is an agreement that was negotiated uh, roughly when when I was born, you know, 50 plus years ago, yep. and uh, we have. Uh, countries around the world that have uh, gone ahead and, and they're part of the Convention and the Law of the Sea. Our adversaries, including China, are part of the Law of the Sea, and most of our friends uh, are part of it. And what is the, this agreement does? Well, it gives, it, it touches on a sweeping number of, of uh, areas that are important to our economy and to our national security at once, including uh, mining rights the ability to mine things uh, like critical minerals from the seabed through deep sea mining. Um, uh, there, there are four minerals in particular that could conceivably, were we to ratify uh, the UN Convention, uh, we would have uh, a massive opportunity to harvest. Uh, they are cobalt, copper, manganese, and nickel and they're in our extended continental shelf, a concept in addition to exclusive economic zones that was created by this law of the sea. 
Um, so property rights to extracting these critical minerals necessary to run a modern economy. Minerals that are even more important now than they yeah, might have been Yeah, because of the CHIPS ago. Act and the need for uh, semiconductor inputs, very important to this state economically, but really to our way of life. Um, but we just see ourselves moving forward into an age of AI and what have you, where, where those will be important. But, you know, cars these days, to, to make this a little more pedestrian, cars yeah. are basically uh, computers with tires on them. So um, we, we, to run a modern economy, you, you need access uh, to these sorts of inputs, or you'll be overly dependent on China. It comes back to having secure property rights because uh, those who insure deep sea miners, those who make the investments, will not have great certainty over their investments uh, and, and unless there's clarity about property rights. Even our allies say there's a lack of, of, of clarity. So we've got to be we have to be uh, at the table negotiating with, through this entity called the International Seabed Authority. That's one reason, one value proposition. I'm going to quickly go through some of sure. these. Another value proposition are undersea cables, whether they deliver energy, electricity is in, increasingly delivered through undersea cables, but internet traffic and, and telecom traffic, 95% of the world's traffic that goes from one country to another actually goes beneath the ocean. There, here again, there, there's, there are established protocols for holding bad actors accountable for property rights, et cetera, within the UN Convention, but our uh, absence uh, throws those into a, a high level of, of uncertainty. But perhaps I, I, most people start with the ability to transit across exclusive economic zones freely. And that transit ability is what the Chinese, for example, are contesting in the South China Sea. So would the Chinese continue to be bad actors after we, after we ratify this, anticipating a counter-argument, I volunteer that, of course they would. But the extent to which we can take that argument away uh, and put it in the hands of, of, of our diplomats, that will, that will redound to our benefit and show that we too, we too in the United States of America, comply with the rules-based order that we are advocating for and from which we benefit. So there, those are a few dimensions sure. to this really important uh, UN convention. Again, this is derivative of a much broader concept of law of the sea which uh, applies to a lot of customary law that's been established mm -hmm. over the years. How did I do, Admiral? Excellent. OK, Excellent. thanks. But tell us, so you were telling us backstage that in a lot of ways, the Coast Guard is sort of basically adhering to this convention. But explain the difference and what it means to have that seat at the table yep. um, for, for us. Yeah. So uh, the Coast Guard, the United States, behaves and operates, and so this extends to the United States Navy, uh, we behave as, as if we were, uh, that we are in compliance with the law of the sea. It, it establishes a code for unexpected encounters at sea. While there may be a lot of water out there, you would be surprised that ships can find themselves on collision courses thousands of miles from any, anywhere else, and it establishes a set of rules to prevent that from, from happening. It allows us to operate, navigate, sail, through the Taiwan Straits. Taiwan Strait is an agreed international strait consistent with the conventions and the rules that are established through the, the law of the sea. So anytime you have normalized, predictable patterns of behavior, which the law of the sea does, particularly as it pertains to safe passage and transit navigation, that's overall a good thing. And the US Coast Guard and our other uh, maritime elements behave and operate that way. I want to touch just briefly on an element of the law of the sea that many may not uh, be aware of, and another reason why it becomes so critical. It establishes rules and authorities for flag states, port states, and coastal states. And in the United States, we function in all three of those. We have a flag state responsibility. The US Coast Guard executes. We inspect our ships. We flag ships. We license and uh, ensure the professional merit professional credentials of our U.S. mariners as a flag state. As a port state, we inspect foreign flag ships as they come in and out of the United States, uh, container ships, uh, cruise ships, uh, to ensure that they're complying with international convention. And then as a coastal state, 
we operate our search and rescue system. We do it, on, we do it for the nation nationally, but also engage and interact with the, with the international search and rescue system. So the reach of the, the law, the C, as it provides uh, sort of foundational elements, again, good rule, of, rule of law, good governance, and establishes normalized patterns of behavior for all who rely on the C for not just uh, free trade, but, but our own prosperity and, and security and safety and uh, you know, the Coast Guard models that uh, whether, we're, whether we're in the homeland or operating far, far abroad. Um, another key issue for the Coast Guard and for all military services, and this is, I think, congressional testimony of yours, you said the Coast Guard is experiencing a personnel shortfall. The service cannot maintain the same level of operations with this gap. We cannot do the same with less. Um, for you, explain that, and then is there something that Congress yeah. can do to help with that shortfall? I mean, this is an issue for a lot of the military branches yeah. right now. Yeah, and so uh, I've been very, uh, very open with regard to the shortfall we're experiencing in the Coast Guard. This time last year, as I said, we're about 55,000 people. We were 3,500 people short, primarily junior, uh, non-rated, just junior people coming into the service. That shortfall has shrunk to about 2,500 today, but it is here and it's here with us today. Not unique to the United States Coast Guard. Every one of not just our military services in the US, but as I travel around the world and meet with other militaries, uh, everyone is experiencing a workforce challenge. We were talking a little bit uh, backstage. Our defense industrial base is where we're all competing to find that, that same talent pool. The 18 year olds that we need this fall to begin attending college, to enter the workforce, they don't exist. There was a drop off in birth rate 18 years ago and so the pool that we're competing wow. from has continued uh, to shrink. There's, been, there's a number of reasons for it, I also, I choke. I, some of this COVID has had some impact. We've seen the rebound, people coming back into the workplace. I do joke that you know, young people, they have feelings about work and it doesn't include work. So that is some of, uh, some of what we're, we're, we're fighting against. To, to your question with regard to how can uh, Congress help, and they, they, have, uh, they have been helpful. The biggest help that Congress can do for the Coast Guard, for all of our uh, national security entities, is uh, timely, reliable budgets that allow the kind of predictability to make long-term investments so that as you're, you're recruiting talent, they see an organization, that's adequately resourced, that are fielding new assets, bringing the kind of IT that you need uh, into, uh, into the mix. For the US Coast Guard, we're fielding those new ships, we're fielding, fielding the new technology. Uh, the shortfalls and the challenges for us come in, in shore infrastructure. Ships don't operate at sea 365 days a year. You gotta tie yes. them up and you gotta maintain them. And so those accounts, the maintenance accounts, are where uh, we owe the narrative to our overseers to make sure that they understand the imperative, but, the, but that is an area of investment that will be critical uh, for, the, for the future of the Coast Guard. Can you deliver a timely budget next year? <laughs> you putting it on my shoulders? <laughs> no, that's not fair. Um, uh, yeah, I'll do my part. I'll do my part, yes. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, what areas do you think that uh, where Congress can step in to help, and whether it's the Coast Guard or other military services also in terms of that personnel and recruiting? Well, I've, uh, actually the Admiral and, and uh, her Coast Guard team is going to be providing me uh, a, a study as we approach uh, the end of the year as it relates particularly to the uh, Western Pacific. If there are additional things that they need, whether in terms of, of personnel investments, perhaps it would be recruiting uh, assistance in some form or fashion, but more importantly, in terms of just basic infrastructure and platforms and, and uh, the ability to scale up the, um, the technical assistance they provide to other Coast Guards around the world, uh, I'm at the ready to be of assistance because I feel like the Coast Guard has for a number of years, having studied this a bit, I mean, it's, it's, it's a gross stock within uh, the United States government portfolio, uh, a very high tooth to tail ratio and 
unlike some of the investments with DOD, I actually favor, favor more de uh, defense spending. I already established that, especially when it relates to naval platforms. But um, there's, there's not a whole lot of fat in the United it's States not, Coast Guard. And, and so I, I would have no trouble justifying that. As it relates to the personnel challenges, we need to look a little longer term. And since I don't know anyone in human history that has identified a real foolproof way to persuade people to have more babies, that's kind of a different department. <laughs> um, I, I, I think legal immigration reform uh, is absolutely something that we're going to have to be thinking more about as, as, as a country. It's a macro response to mm -hmm. sort of okay. uh, applied to this uh, issue. I will say as it relates to the law of the sea, I, I want to get this out there. These concerns aren't abstract legal concerns. This is a live fire exercise. Every day. We have uh, the United States military, we have commercial vessels uh, whose transit through the Taiwan Straits or the South China Sea, it's, it's either contested or it's made more problematic, that of our allies and partners, uh, the same, on account of the lack of legal certainty uh, that uh, is, is perceived to exist, even by our allies, uh, because we are not a signatory. I go further. Uh, the uh, deep sea mining rights I, I, I spoke to. If we were to extract, there's a map that came out last year. We've been working 20 years on this map to establish where our extended continental shelf uh, actually lies beneath the ocean. And because of the mineral resources there, we could extract 20 times, 20 times the known terrestrial reserves that currently exist of the, the, the four named minerals. So, I mean, that's pretty powerful. Next year, permitting opens up. So other nation, national uh, based countries could be applying for our minerals uh, if, if we don't move, hopefully this Congress and get this done. Looking at the telecom issue and the, and the subsea cable issue, uh, we, we saw the Russians, uh, who, had, uh, uh, who allegedly uh, uh, sabotaged uh, the, the, the pipeline uh, uh, you know, off, off the European coast. They've had some other activities uh, that uh, we haven't been able to nail down, uh, but it looks like they could be messing with some of these telecoms. Uh, but, but we lack the legal basis to call them uh, in, out in a way we should. And the Houthis. The Houthis uh, just engaged in an act of sabotage that some didn't think they were capable of uh, in, in the Middle East. So um, I mean, this is really a, a present geopolitical issue, which is why some of us in Congress are pushing right now for a resolution that would make clear that we have enough members of Congress who are prepared uh, to vote to, uh, to actually you know, uh, make this the law of the land uh, in the United States. And, and uh, Senator Murkowski, who's, who's felt strongly about this issue for a lot of years, is trying to signal to leadership by circulating a resolution uh, that there are enough R's and D's to satisfy the requisite two-third present uh, so that we can ratify this, this law of the sea treaty. Okay. Um, you also, there was talk earlier about the CHIPS Act and... Um, you are the, the, you know, the sort of driving force behind it, especially on the Republican side. Um, it has sometimes just been boiled down to as like a domestic jobs product, uh, project, um, but I know you view it as a national security issue. Um, so talk about where that, you know, the implementation of that yes. is going and how important that is, you know, Vis-a-vis, -vis, I feel like, God, I really feel like a foreign policy person. I'm saying vis-a-vis, -vis. <laughs> you know, compared with Taiwan and it's, you know, that yeah. geopolitical uh, place. Um, implementation is going exceptionally well. Uh, this, this legislation, beginning years ago as, as the Endless Frontier Act, an investment in research uh, of, of critical and emerging technologies, uh, research like Hyper, into fields like hypersonics and material science and quantum computing, autonomous systems and, 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 and so forth, evolved uh, over a period of iterations into a supply chain resiliency uh, package as, as well, 
with the emphasis on, on semiconductors. So it's now all of those things. It, it's a, a massive increase in, in federal investment in research uh, as the Chinese and, and uh, others race to come up with breakthroughs with national security implications in those tech areas. But it's also an effort to secure our supply chain. We saw how important this can be to a nation's economic security in the midst of the pandemic. Auto assembly plants in, in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, riddling. Heck, you go to Target and uh, with your mask on, uh, uh, of course, and, and uh, you couldn't find a toaster. So a modern economy cannot run without access to enough of these chips. But your ability to make chips for a toaster is very similar to your ability to make chips for nuclear missile submarines and radar systems and, and F-35s. So of course this is a national security issue. We don't want China to be able to interrupt the supply of any of those chips, but especially those needed to, to defend our values. We also don't want to trust uh, counterparties, whether it's China uh, or, or, or others, unless they're really uh, strongly uh, trusted, our best friends, to make the most critical components uh, of these chips or they'll end up perhaps failing uh, uh, or uh, not fulfilling their, their uh, stated purpose in these weapon systems. So implementation has gone well. I mean, the goal is, as Secretary Raimondo uh, is consistently sharing with people is, is to really, you almost have to reconstitute this entire ecosystem in the United States after we lost it in the 80s and 90s and, and it gravitated overseas. To do that, we had to offer subsidies just as every other country in the world is offering subsidies to make it you know, economically advantageous to build these here, which is why Arizona has had so many you know, monumental announcements and we hope for uh, more moving forward. Uh, state of Indiana's uh, uh, also been able to benefit from this, but it's not a jobs bill. That is, that is a happy uh, byproduct of a national security initiative to make our economy more resilient and to ensure that we invest in our critical semiconductors uh, and, and that those have fidelity once uh, sure. we use them for national security purposes. Sure. Uh, do you want to weigh in on that? And then I kind of want you each to, at the end here, sort of answer in a quick form of like, what's your biggest worry or fear about that region? So I, I'm not, I'm not going to touch on the chips. I agree completely. I'm going to go back to the law of the sea and its criticality. So we are not in a position as a nation to file a claim for our extended outer continental shelf. And this is as it pertains particularly to the outer continental shelf off of Alaska. We're an Arctic nation in addition to being a Pacific nation and an Atlantic nation and not having a seat at the table uh, diminishes our ability to assert our own, uh, our own sovereignty. Um, with regard to just sort of broadly and kind of in reflection, what I want to leave you with is there is no better return on investment for our national security and economic prosperity than the United States Coast Guard. We're a small force, but we are a nimble force that creates opportunity and partnership capacity in a way that the U.S. Navy cannot, and I love the U.S. Navy, but their mission is very different from ours. And so uh, I don't want you to take away that the United States Coast Guard is just focused on our coast. We do that. We do a lot of critical uh, work there, but our work is global. It's international. We are a partner of choice. There's a resounding cry for the kinds of uh, skill, authority, <coughs> capacity that the United States Coast Guard brings to not just other Coast Guards, but other navies. Yeah. I would argue 75% of the world's navies actually are functioning as a Coast Guard. And so don't draw a bright line between the US Coast Guard and other, uh, other navies. We are a unique instrument of national power and national authority. And I'm excited to be, uh, be, sure. be looking at what the opportunity in the futures are. Closing thought and also yeah. is there? Closing thought, what a privilege and, to be here with all of you. Uh, and what a privilege to be here with Admiral Fagan that's just doing a great job uh, leading the Coast Guard. Um, I'll, I will sort of end on a macro thought. I think yeah. I mentioned earlier America's sort of the grand strategy, which for generations has in, in, involved two key pillars. First, we want to make sure that we have uh, on each side of the Eurasian supercontinent uh, that we are sufficiently balancing uh, any other 
competitors, any other adversaries that may, may seek to gain dominance in those areas, so in, in Europe and in Asia. I feel like we're appropriately focused uh, on that as a country. Um, the thing I'm, I, and, and we need to invest more in the military and the other uh, you know, critical investments that we mentioned earlier. The, the piece that concerns me is the second uh, bit, which is, you know, we have long been a, a trading nation. We've been a trading nation. It benefits all of us materially in our personal lives, and um, uh, it benefits us by extension militarily. Uh, and it also creates an incentive for uh, us to deepen our relationships uh, with our closest allies and, and, and partners. Um, we are withdrawing from trade agreements. We haven't passed a new free trade agreement in, in, in years. So that uh, undermines those incentives I just talked about, and it will impact our ability uh, to, to grow and therefore uh, to sustain uh, the military wherewithal to defend our values, all the while China and others are, are stealing market share and establishing very close relationships. Uh, so that's the biggest piece to me. I, I, on, a, on a subset of, of our geoeconomics, uh, dealing with the uh, uh, weaponization of markets and the predatory nature of the Chinese state capitalist system, I think we are there again appropriately attentive but we need to get back into the trade game for the long term. That's my biggest concern. All right. Yeah. Well, listen, everybody, yeah. thank you very much. We really appreciate it.